And also, one thing I've learned by watching the previous speakers is that you're supposed to have your, your Twitter handle on the, on the slides. Mine is Wilkens. It's my last name, simply. And I love when people tweet. I should really put that on every slide. OK, but what I'm going to talk about is uh, our, what we have learned during these two years when we have created three games. Um, but the challenge of VR is that we think that the hardware now is good enough. It has reached that point where you can actually create nice VR experiences. It's, um, it's still first generation. That's pretty obvious. It has its flaws. But you can actually do good stuff with it. So the next step, now it's up to us, the software developers, to create these experiences for this hardware that the hardware, hardware manufacturers so nicely have made for us. And this is a challenge that we at Resolution Games have taken on. So who are we? Resolution. Yeah. We develop social, accessible games for a broad target audience. And uh, we have been focusing only on mobile VR. We are focusing completely on VR, and all our games so far have been on mobile VR. Uh, an interesting thing to note there is that all our games so far have been free, because we believe that a freemium model we act, but the game is free and you pay for extra content is a very viable business model in VR, as well as on mobile. So let me tell you a bit about the company. It was founded almost exactly two years ago. And we started out in this, with this little team, only five people in a very cramped little room in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, we're not in this room anymore. We have grown, so that's good. A few months later, we released our first game, which is called Solitary Jester, for the Samsung Gear VR. And this was based on the idea that we noticed that VR experiences or VR games don't have to be so action-filled or spectacular. Uh, in, because in VR, it's just nice to be at some nice location. So we created this uh, cozy room with like bookshelves and a, a fireplace and a, and a desk, and you get to play a card game in that location. Um, so it's a very calm experience, and that works very well in VR. And some people thought this sounded ridiculous. Why would you want to play a solitaire in VR? But once people actually tried it, they, they liked it. It's a pretty nice experience. Then we got some funding. It's good to have, a f have funding if you want to uh, make games. Um, because we're in this in the long run. The market for VR is pretty small now. It's difficult to make money with the, with the business model that we have, because we believe, as I mentioned before, that we believe in, in freemium games. So we have funding enough to keep us going for a while, because we're in this for, for the long run. And by this time, the, the company had grown, so we were uh, enough to create a second team. And so by now, we had two teams, because we want to a game development team to be about eight people, not bigger than that. So currently we have two teams that work in parallel. Then the Samsung Gear VR was released. And if you're following along, that means that we released our first game, the Solitaire Jester, before the hardware was actually released. Uh, so, but there were like development kits around. So basically, we made a game for other developer, developers. But we made it ma mainly because we wanted to, to learn what VR 
what VR is and how to make games for it. Our second game was Bait. It was a fishing game. And this was also based on this idea that VR doesn't mean to have a lot of, lot of action and be intense and spectacular. So instead you go to like nice, calm location and catch some fishes, which is, feels pretty relaxing. And we think that this may be one of the most downloaded games uh, on mobile VR, or maybe VR in general, actually. Because it was an early title for the Gear VR, and it's, it provides a very nice experience. It doesn't feel like an experimental thing. It feels like a complete game. And it's, I think that's why it's become very popular, and because it's free, of course. Then came Google Daydream, which is very similar to, to the Gear VR in that you, it's a device, it's a headset that you put on your head and put your mobile phone in it. But the design is different. It feels more like a piece of clothing than, than a piece of technology. So it feels very nice. It's made of cloth and it's soft and it has this uh, nice, nice fabric. And the headset contains no electronics at all, except for an NFC chip that's only used for detecting when you actually put the phone in the device. And all, it also co comes with a controller, this little, little thing to the left here that you hold in your hand as a, to control things, which provides very good, nice input. And Daydream is a platform that uh, Google licenses to other manufacturers. Uh, and also it uses the normal Android ecosystem compared to the Gear VR where you actually download apps from a separate store, the Oculus store. Um, but in Gear, but in, on Daydream it's just a normal Android application that you install, install from Play Store. Uh, so it has the potential to become really big. At the same time as Google, Google released Daydream, we released a game for it called Wonderglade. And the idea for this was that we created several, we came up with several game ideas that would work with the Daydream headset and the controller. And then we implemented some of these ideas as mini games, basically, in a, uh, and which are shown as attraction in, in a theme park. So you walk around in a theme park and enter an attraction and there's a game. And no roller coasters, definitely no roller coasters. So this was a, was a launch title for Daydream. So I mentioned at the start, we make social games. And this is a kind of a problem with VR to be social. On this image you have uh, two VR headsets lying in there, unused, lonely, and the people in the background are doing something else. So what are they doing? They seem to have very much fun together. This is actually from a conference that we had uh, a couple of months ago. And these people are playing a console game. And as you can see, a console game can be a very social experience. There are, two, there are four people playing this game, but there are lots of people hanging around. But the difference in VR is that you get isolated from your surroundings instead. And being isolated from the, your surroundings can be pretty nice sometimes. Um, but we humans are social beings, so it just normally doesn't feel very good to isolate yourself from other people the way you do in VR. So we think that successful VR games will be social. In the Wonderglade, we solved it this way. Imagine like a social event, like a party or a family gathering. Today, there will probably be only one person in that, that uh, party that owns a VR headset in the first place. And we made a mode where people take turns putting the headset on. So I play the game for a few minutes, and then maybe I pass it on to my mother as she gets to play it and see if she can beat my score. And then she passes uh, it along to someone else and so on. 
And this pass and play thing is a relatively easy way to make a game multiplayer and social. But in the future, we, we expect uh, most people to, we expect most uh, VR games that are social to be actually online and multiplayer, I mean traditional multiplayer. There will probably be some very successful MMOs for for VR, for example. Another thing we did was that we added non-player characters to the game. This also makes it very low, uh, it makes it feel like you have company, like it becomes less lonely, even if it's not a real human being, it at least feels that you have someone else there with you. And another thing that we noticed is that as the VR environment feels very real and if there is a char character in the VR world that looks you in the eyes, that is, uh, can be pretty intense. It really feels like there is someone there and it's, that's very powerful. So what about accessible? I mentioned accessible. That's a word that basically we have tried to invent. Um, it's, it's that the, it should be easy to get into the game, to start playing the game, and it, everyone should be able to play the game pretty quickly. So we have this philosophy that if you own a headset and your mother comes to visit, and you want to show her this nice VR headset you have got, it would be a resolution games game that you show her. And this also illustrates what we think how people will play VR games, especially mobile VR games. It won't be in a swivel chair. Uh, it will probably be in a sofa like this. Sofa or couch. Is sofa, is, is that more British or does anyone know? Um, anyway. This means that you can't design gameplay which requires a 360 view because you can't turn that much. That would be uncomfortable. So what we have done is, uh, is that we just design the game so the gameplay takes place basically in front of you. So you don't have to turn. And this, this definitely limits what you can do with level design and also user interface design that you have this limit. You still have content on the back side, but there's nothing important there. Another thing that we think VR games is not played in the same casual way as mobile games. Uh, if, you look, they look, if you look at this graph, this shows the number of users per day for bait, the fishing game. And you can see that it has these bumps, and the, those are the, the weekends. So people definitely play the games more often on the weekends. And also you can't see it in this graph, but they play it more in the evenings as well. So it's not a game you just pick up to play two minutes while you're waiting for the bus. You want to put, up, put on a VR headset and not on the bus either, probably, because that would feel a bit weird. So VR games is something you play at home, mostly. So that's something that we have to keep in mind as, as game designers. And the one big challenge with VR is the input. Many VR games for PC use a gamepad, but most people don't have a gamepad for their phone. And also for an unexperienced player, it feels a bit weird to have this, uh, this gamepad. It doesn't feel natural. It's difficult to find the buttons and so on in VR. Here is an alternative input that was the first thing we prototyped. We used an exercise bike to control the speed in a racing game. Uh, and this, yeah, this, this was a fun experiment, but it's not realistic. Um, instead, in VR, you have this, uh, the main input that you have always have in VR is the way the user is looking when he's turning his head. And uh, we can use that as, a, that's, that as input, for example, to look at things, to select them. Tangerina. And also, like in bait here, 
uh, control the fishing rod by Isn't just looking great. around. And this does, it doesn't seem very natural, but actually it doesn't feel too bad. It feels pretty good. Except in this game, people, some people want to um, cast with their heads. They do like this to try to throw. Um, so that's not very comfortable. And the Gear VR also has a, a touchpad on the right side here, which is a proper touchpad, but we use it only as a button, basically. And this guy is holding a, a piece of soft foam to pretend he is fishing or something. It's not part of the game. And this is from Wonderglade, where we have the controller, which has a, an orientation sensor, so you can point in different directions, which is uh, very nice. It doesn't have positional tracking at all. It's only relative rotation. Uh, but it feels pretty good, as long as it's calibrated. And this could be a problem. Google has a pretty good onboarding for this, but it's difficult, with, especially in pass and play, or, or when you're going to show someone else the VR, because they haven't gone through Google's tutorial about how the controller works and how you recenter the controller and calibrate it and stuff like that. And we have a pretty, have had pretty much many problems with that. So we should have added more. Um, more instructions in the game for how the controller works. Yeah, there's the, no VR talk can be complete without talking about motion sickness. And motion sickness, uh, you get that when what your eye sees, if your eye, if your eye sees that you're accelerating and your, your body doesn't feel that it acceler it's accelerating, uh, you'll get sick. Uh, so we have this very simple solution to that. We just don't move the camera. And that's, uh, that's a very conservative solution to it. There are, uh, other, there are some research on how to limit the motion sickness. And uh, we have tried some of that, but not in any game that we have released. So how did it go with this broad target audience thing that we wanted to do? Um, well, first of all, this is the reviews for bait, 4.8 stars. That's very good. Ah, so we're pretty happy with that. I'm scary. I just... uh, the only negative uh, review we had actually says that it's a game for kids. And that's a bit worrying for us, actually, because we want our games to have a broad audience. Uh, so maybe we should think about making it more more adult somehow, because we don't do, want to lose users. And also, there is a recommendation that v kids shouldn't use VR at all. So you can't design, you can't publish VR games for kids. This is the number of installs. Uh, and this shows that, because this, this is for a Wonder Blade, and Daydream has only been released in a few countries, so we can't reach a really, really huge audience yet. Which explains the low number of downloads that we actually have, honestly, right now. For Wonderblade. But we expect, as any new technology, that VR will have an exponential growth. Once it takes off, it will be huge. And uh, so, once the market is ready, uh, we'll be there. And, and we're getting the experience today to, to build games for tomorrow's users. That's it. Thank you very much.